A very warm welcome to our webinar series, uh, Critical Transitions in Complex System, or what we call CTCS seminar series, is being jointly hosted by IIT Madras in India and Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research of PIC in Germany. The seminar series brings together experts from fields such as climate science, combustion, fluid mechanics, neuroscience, etc., and aims to disseminate the state of the art in the prediction of critical transitions in these diverse fields of study. Uh, the seminar series takes place every month on the last Monday of the month. So please mark your calendars. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, a few housekeeping notes. I request everyone to turn off their microphones, I keep the keep microphones in mute, and please type in the question on the questions in the Q and A box, and the speaker will answer the questions at the end of the talk. There will be plenty of time to answer. Now let me introduce the uh, speaker for today, Professor Istvan Kiss is professor at St. Louis University, and we are so happy that he is here today. He studied chemistry and received his PhD degree at the University of Debrecen, Hungary. He worked with Professor Jack Hudson at the University of Virginia as a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, the research of Professor Kiss focuses on nonlinear dynamics of electrochemical systems with emphasis on coupled oscillators and applications to sensors, batteries, and corrosion mitigations. He was a recipient of Fulbright Fellowship NSF Career Award and American, American Chemical Society St. Louis Award. Professor Kiss has published over 130 scientific publications in journals that include prestigious ones like Science, Nature, PRL, Nature Communications, and PNAS. So today, Professor Kiss will speak about synchronization engineering. How do we improve synchronization with control and uh, heterogeneity? So I will give the floor to Professor Istvan Kiss. Uh, here you go. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Let me share my presentation again and let's please. Yes. All right. And then let's see my pointer. Let's get the pointer for me. Did I do it? Wait. Yeah, it's there. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction. It is my pleasure to be here and uh, talk about synchronization engineering. This is a project we've, you know, we have been working on since the end of 1990s. It will be more of an overview talk, but I see in the audience there are some people who are experts in control. One thing I kind of message I, I'd like to discuss is that very often when we talk about control, especially about synchronization, we have some sort of assumption that the oscillators are re relatively similar, and then we can do still we can still the control in spite of this presence of heterogeneity. So I'd like to overview kind of our work, what we did on synchronization engineering, but I'd like to show you like three or four, some interesting papers that we published recently, where we like to take, like to demonstrate how we can like take advantage of this heterogeneity. Be, uh, in the oscillator properties. So first, I'd, first I'd like to uh, uh, acknowledge the collaborators. Again, you know, most of the talk will be an overview, but we have these uh, four papers that I, that I like to highlight in this talk. And then let's see if I can get my pointer going. So uh, one collaboration that we did was led by Tiago Pereira at Sao Paulo University, and then with Edin Ehold and Denis Zeruglu, who is in Turkey. So this will be the, the work that we did on emergent hyper networks. And my longtime collaborator on control is here in Jershin Lee in St. Louis, Washington University in St. Louis. And we started working with Anatoly Zlotnik, who is now in the Los Alamos National Lab, and Barat Signal, who is still currently a group member. And then we had SNU students, Jorge Ocampo, Michael Sebek, and Rafael Nagao, who is now working at Unicam. And then uh, this work that we really started on, on synchronization of these heterogeneous oscillators started with collaboration with Edilson Motter at Northwestern and his uh, student, Yuan Zhao Zeng. This is Edilson Motter. So I'm a chemist by training. So we study complex chemical systems. And when you think about complex chemical systems, maybe you think something extremely complicated, but this is not quite the truth. Very simple reactions can also generate extremely complicated dynamics. So I think there is one reaction most of us who drove a car should be uh, aware of. 
is that when you burn your fuel, you often make, uh, especially if you're idling your car a lot, a lot of carbon monoxide. And we needed some catalyst in your car, a piece of platinum that can, that converts the carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide. This is a simple reaction as you can think of. Carbon monoxide absorbs on the surface and then oxygen absorbs on the surface of your catalyst and they just react and they make a product. This is the mechanism of this reaction. And Gerhard Ertel received Nobel Prize in 2007 for imaging this surface reaction and finding out that we have these amazingly complex patterns. Uh, let me see if I can come back to this video. Uh, that uh, can start out with the spirals, but the spirals can break up. What you see is the signal related to the oxygen coverage of this piece of platinum in your car. And Gerhard Ertel told in his Nobel uh, address that it is possible to tame this chemical turbulence. Uh, they use the a feedback technique, a control technique, that they measure the overall intensity from this from this picture, from these uh, images that they obtained, they, that they looked at, they delayed this signal, and they fed it back to the partial pressure of the reactant of the carbon monoxide, and they managed to convert this, this very complicated uh, dynamics into uniform oscillations. Right, so uh, this is some you know, very exciting research that started at the end of 90s and early 2000s. So some time had passed, like kind of all contribution to this field was to see how can we engineer chemical complexity with synchronization of oscillators. Right? So our focus will be control of synchronization of oscillators. And then I think if you looked at some sort of biological signal, the first thing that comes to your mind that this is rather complex. This is not like a pendulum kind of oscillation, some very periodic. And uh, they are kind of complex. And then one idea why they are complex is, is that they are noisy, but there is more to it. Uh, you know, the frequency can be modulated. Uh, and then, uh, so the one idea why this, this these cycles can be so complex because they arise from interactions of many cyclic components. And I, I think one of the nicest example was demonstrated early in the synchronization studies is this coupling between our heart rate and our breathing. Um, so many biological systems, uh, it may, the level of synchron is at optimal level. And when I say optimal, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it is a lot or it is very little. It is some sort of level in terms of structure. Do we have like synchronized oscillations or desynchronized oscillations or some clusters? So, that, so there is some sort of optimal level that is that provides some physiological function. There could be some stability, you know how like some oscillations can respond to some changes to the environment. So uh, structural stability or some local stability. And then, so this this sort of, when the structure breaks up, so for instance, you have too much synchrony in your brain, then you have an epileptic seizure. Or if you have too little synchrony, then your brain cannot process any information. For instance, you can have Alzheimer's disease. So there is some sort of optimal level of synchrony. And one idea is that to counter this loss of physiological function is reestablish this synchrony, right? So way you can think about it is that some sort of pacemaker, not for your heart, but pacemaker for your brain to, to reach this uh, optimal level of synchrony and time. And then I think in the early times, we were interested in this control of uh, synchronization. We wanted first to demonstrate something that is extremely complex. We did this work with Jack Hudson. So we wanted to to create, to look at some systems that nobody controlled before. We took a large population of chaotic oscillators and we wanted to control them. And then after a few years, we realized that, well, this is really a complex system. And then there is a much simpler system. We still don't know how to control a population of periodic oscillators, like a lower level of complexity. And then a few years later, we realized, well, we know very little about actually control of a single oscillator. So you can see that the early decade we were it was they were more like ad hoc studies of like different oscillators and different levels of complexity. And I think in the past decade or so, we started to work up this field of control of synchronization from more of a control theoretic point of view. 
starting with control of a single oscillators and how we can generalize it. And you know, we are in a way going back to where we started from this control of a population of chaotic oscillators. So I will, I, I work a lot with, uh, with uh, applied mathematician and um, theoretical physicists, but we do a lot of experiments to demonstrate these, these, these control principles that we come up with. And then our favorite system for this is this nickel electrode dissolution system. If you see like a coin, often have a lot of nickel in it, this sort of green color is the is the nickel oxide and nickel hydroxide that, so, that, that forms. So in a way you have nickel in this and nickel oxide and hydroxide. This is what we study in the lab, just with a lot more control. We put a piece of nickel wire into sulfuric acid and then the nickel starts to corrode, just like your coin starts to corrode. And then during the corrosion, you can get this uh, corrosion product, for instance, nickel oxide and nickel hydroxide. And then, so we have a metal covered with some metal film. And then the, the way the nickel can dissolve, the nickel ions can go through this nickel oxide membrane controls, is controlled by the chemical environment. So this system exhibits some similarities to neural system, for instance, when you have an intercellular ions, usually like sodium or potassium, you have a membrane and the chemical environment contro controls the flow of the ion channel. And we have very similar models. We have a simple two variable model that we can use to, uh, to, you know, to verify for some of the theories before we go to the experiment. And then at constant potential, these systems can generate uh, current oscillations that can be rise through Hopf bifurcation, they have very nice smooth waveform that can be relaxation oscillators, very spiky, or they can be chaotic oscillators. This we can control with the, with the chemistry, and then we can build networks. And the first network that we built was a globally coupled network with a, with a shunt resistance. So we, we can connect to these metal wires, individual and collective resistances. And when we have a collective resistance that acts as a global coupling, to the electrode potential of all the electrodes, and we can calculate this coupling strengths. But the interesting thing was that without any, without any coupling, the system shows some desynchronized behavior. And then we coupled them with this positive coupling. Then we got a one cluster synchronized state. And then when we use the negative resistance, we use the three cluster state. And I think Professor Katarina Krischer, who also gave a talk uh, at this seminar series, uh, posed this question, why is it that you know with positive coupling, you get one cluster state with negative coupling with three cluster state in some other systems, it's, it's the opposite. With negative coupling, we get three cluster state with positive, uh, with negative coupling, we get one cluster state with positive coupling, three cluster state. So what really controls this? And then we work quite a bit with uh, the wider group of Kuramoto, uh, especially with uh, Hiroshi Kori, on trying to model these chemical systems, not with kinetic models, but with phase models. Right. So when we have this uh, complex nonlinear systems that we have usually many variables and we have some sort of a limit cycle, and then when the system is going around the limit cycle, that is some sort of a, we can represent the state of the system with the angle. And then if you stay, close to this phase angle most of the time, just by modeling the phase angle, you can get the concentrations of all the species. And so in this phase models, we try to model how fast we go around the limit cycle as a function of you know, different uh, uh, inputs. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, you know, we, we use this uh, averaged phase models where the instantaneous frequency, so the velocity at which we go around the, the limit cycle depends on the natural frequency and the state of the oscillator population, right? And then this, how these uh, instantaneous frequencies are affected by the state is described by this uh, phase interaction function. Uh, Kuramoto proposed that to, this uh, for theoretical studies, it's uh, we can use as a prototype system as some sort of sinusoidal, but certainly for practical systems, this interaction function has to be extracted. Uh, can, they can be found directly from experiments. And then we can use this model to predict this one cluster, three cluster, desynchronized state of the oscillators. 
So I'd like to kind of tell why control is difficult of the, for synchronization. Usually we have a population of oscillators with a relatively large number of elements. So we can have, you know, certain biological pacemakers from, you know, five to 10 oscillators or billions of neurons in our brain. So, you know, we can have a huge number of uh, these discrete elements. And then if we were able to put a controller of each of these units in each of the neuron in our brain, then control would be more similar to traditional control of these of this uh, nonlinear system. But we really have an underactuated control system. You know, it is not realistic to put a controller for on each of the neuron in our brain. So then we can have two solutions for this. One is we use some sort of global control, for instance, you know, magnetic field for our brain. Or we can put a controller like a big electrode that controls maybe thousands or millions of uh, the state of thousands of millions of neurons. So we can collect some sort of global signal from the oscillators, and then we use that global signal to do some global control, but we still want to control some collective properties, some phase pattern, some sort of synchronization pattern. Right, and the other idea for this to solve this underactuated control problem is to put a single controller to some place and then measure the state or some state of some of the oscillators and then just make put a control on one of them and then take use of the coupling between the units and propagate this control signal through coupling. And then that's how to control the system. So we can do pinning control or some sort of global control. So we do research in both in both directions. Uh, yeah, we do research in both directions. And I, in this talk, I will show you some uh, some results on this global global control, measuring global signals and apply global control patterns. And this problem was really solved uh, first uh, in. In this, uh, the in you know, collaboration with Hiroshi Kori. So the idea is that we have some sort of oscillator population that are described by their phase by their states. These are all oscillatory units. They can be simplest description is that they are uncoupled, or there could be some coupling. We are going to overcome this in inherent coupling in the population. So we create a global signal, for instance, some average uh, mean, mean field type of variable. Then what our proposal was that we can use some sort of delayed feedback to control the synchronization property. So we often have to use some sort of delay. We have to have some gain. And the simplest thing is just use some sort of linear delayed feedback. And we have to find a control parameter that controls the state of each individual oscillators. Right, and then the idea you can have extremely complex nonlinear dynamics of each individual oscillators, you know, described by hundred variables. But we still we try to represent the, their states by the phase variable only. So the idea was that in order to induce a certain phase pattern, first you have to write a phase model for this, and that's why we had to work with people, theoretical physicists who knew very well phase model. Usually, you take a phase model. And then you predict what's the pattern. And then now we have to work opposite. For a given pattern, you have to come up with a phase model. But if you know sufficiently deeply about the behavior of this phase model, it is not that complicated to do. So once you have this phase model, this phase model, we will basically assume, again, we come back to this heterogeneity, that these are nearly identical oscillators. And then we can this, uh, engineer this synchronization states by this uh, the shape of this interaction function that basically comes from the response function, how the system responds to individual pulses, plus the feedback that we put in. And the, we tied all different kinds of format of feedback. And then what we found that one very efficient way to control these systems is this uh, is this polynomial, delayed polynomial feedback. We have a first order feedback with a delay. We have a second order feedback with its delay, a third order feedback and its delay. And then we can determine these feedback gains and these feedback delays in such a way that a certain interaction function is in use that results in a certain phase pattern. Right? And then we apply this control perturbation. 
And this was a super uh, powerful technique. Uh, you know, we can go to the lab and uh, now we could just design these feedbacks. So now instead of a constant potential, we will change this potential. We have a real time controller that will determine at, at each time step, what is the potential that needs to be set uh, depending on the measured currents, the rate of matter dissolutions. And then we just use this delayed nonlinear feedback uh, and then uh, you know, we can test this. And we have like some very interesting application, but here I just show you something very simple is that we take a population of oscillators and Hiroshi Kori showed that when you apply a mostly linear feedback, the dominant term in the interaction function will be a sine function. And thus we, we can expect a perfectly synchronized, uniformly oscillating one cluster state. And then if we use a second order feedback, we again determine the, the feedback gains and the delays, then the system will split up into a two cluster state where we have that the oscillators uh, where the oscillators uh, synchronize in anti-phase configurations. With a third order feedback, we get a three cluster state and then four cluster state can be applied with a fourth order feedback. And uh, so like this just very nicely demonstrates that, uh, you know, how powerful this technique that very, with very simple, uh, experimental technique, we could create this one cluster, two cluster, three cluster, four cluster state. So I think we kind of answered the uh, Katarina Fischer's question that now we can design some sort of feedback and coupling that can induce this sort of different kinds of cluster states. One thing that we did, we, we were not able to control with this, you can see that although we have like a two cluster state here, but we really, let me try to free, freeze this at the right time. We really because the, all the oscillators were nearly identical, we really couldn't control the, which, which element belongs to which cluster state because they were nearly identical. So uh, many possible cluster states can of course arise that are cl two clusters, even if they have the same configuration. And I will come back to this uh, problem later. So like one challenge with this, uh, with this, with this synchronization engineering technique was, that we work with nearly identical oscillators. And we always assume that if you have some heterogeneities, so the natural frequencies are a little bit different, we put in strong enough coupling that these inherent heterogeneities are suppressed. And we can do this because of the Kuramoto transition to synchronization. When we increase the coupling strength, there is often a critical coupling strength above which the synchronization sets in. And if this coupling strength is uh, strong enough, you just get a synchronized state very similar to what you would get with identical oscillators. So larger the heterogeneity, larger coupling strength is needed to synchrony. So heterogeneity destroys synchronization. So when we started working with Edison Motor, he really made some you know, foundational breakthrough breakthroughs in understanding how we can take advantage, sync uh, the heterogeneity of a system to get a better synchronized system. But this is not so trivial. So Edison showed us this very interesting uh, problem of just taking the uh, Stuart Landau oscillators that are coupled with some ring topology in this case. So each oscillator is coupled to its neighbor with a certain delay. And uh, if you take completely identical system without any delay, you just get the synchronized state. So I think uh, it's kind of difficult to see, but uh, this is just a synchronized state, fully synchronized. So, but if you add some, uh, if you add to this system, some sort of uh, heterogeneity, of course the, the system becomes desynchronized, right? So uh, if you have some sort of coupling, there is a critical amount of heterogeneity and you add this and then the system goes to a desynchronized state. So usually heterogeneity results in desynchronized state. But what Edison showed us is that you can, you can get with some delay, if you add some delay to the system, uh, this is not necessarily the case. So here we added enough delay that uh, the signals really cannot... Uh, the coupling cannot uh, support fully synchronized state over the system. Even if you start the system from nearly synchronized state, this, this fully synchronized state is unstable. And then you see that these are the signals from the elements that the system goes to a desynchronized state. And then we find that when we add heterogeneity, 
I can show you maybe in the equations where we add the heterogeneities. We add the heterogeneities into this parameter here, uh, this non isochronicity parameter in the stuart landau system. You have to find proper uh, type of heterogeneities to add. Then, and then here the, the node size uh, shows you like how much heterogeneity we added for, the, for that parameter uh, relative to each other. And it is completely random. You know, it is not like you try to kind of... Uh, uh, do something. This is random heterogeneity. And now if you start from a nearly synchronized system, the system remains around this synchronized solution. So the random heterogeneity can stabilize synchronized oscillation. Then with identical system, you get this synchronization. So this is, we wanted to demonstrate this with some experimental system. Uh, so we used our, our, this delayed control system, but instead of Instead of a global signal, we use the uh, network equivalent of this. So we go to each of these electrodes and then we come up with some network topology and then we look at the currents of the neighbors and then we delay the currents of the neighbors with some delay. We subtract what the current state of the system and then feedback with some uh, network topology to this, to this potential. And we can build like up to uh, like you know, 25 nodes or so, any kind of uh, system like this. And then we build a 2D grid with this, with 16 electrode, with 16 electrode systems. Uh, so this is uh, every element is coupled to their neighbors. And then if we have zero delay, we get a fully synchronized state. If we have some delay that is about half of the period, then we get this system where every element is synchronized anti-phase to its neighbors. Maybe I try to freeze this movie at the right time. Okay, very good. You can see here that, that uh, every element has the same state as every other element in this small grid. So this is sort of a two cluster state with, about, with a delay of about half of the period of the cycle. But in between, we have this uh, very complex system that shows... Uh, no fairly regular oscillations. One way to think about it is that the system cannot decide if it's uh, one cluster or two cluster state, and it goes it in and out of this one and two cluster states. So this is with nearly identical system. And this is, uh, we wanted to test if with heterogeneity, we can improve the synchrony. So we added different individual resistances to the oscillators that makes them to have a different natural frequency. At larger resistance, the frequency is a little bit larger. It changes the time scale by which the ions absorb to the surface of this nickel wire. And we had quite a bit of heterogeneity. So here, these individual resistances are shown on, on the grid, and it is random. You know, this is not some sort of that tries to kind of counter some, some inherent heterogeneity in it. And to our big surprise, of course, this was predicted by some numerical simulations and some theory of Edison. With this heterogeneous system, it shows like completely synchronized on uh, behavior. So this was this idea that in some oscillators with some networks, adding heterogeneity can improve synchrony. So this can this can help synchronization engineering if you find uh, such a behavior. So the other uh, project that we worked on related with this uh, real-time closed-loop feedback system is other type of nonlinear feedback that was really inspired with some neural systems uh, where Carl Friston studied MEG recordings of, of, of the brain with when uh, the people were doing some sort of test, for instance, moving the finger, and then they were analyzing some sort of synchrony. And then what kind of the conclusion from these studies was, was that short distance, uh, Linear coupling usually appears between short distance of nodes network of similar frequencies, and then nonlinear coupling is needed among different frequencies when you want to have synchronization in remote brain regions. So we designed this sort of systems that uh, that can simulate this this sort of behavior. Like we just built four oscillators that can interact with each other with delayed feedback. It is the same delayed feedback what we had before. So we take, we measure the state, for instance, uh, oscillator two, we delay it, 
and then we put it back to the potential that drives oscillator one. But before we do that, we modulate the state of oscillator, the, modulate the signal that we are standing with the state of this oscillator one. And then we do a nonlinear modulation, linear and quadratic. And this kind of modulation is very important to show the effect that I'm uh, trying to describe here. So, and then we took largely different oscillators. So this is something that we didn't do in the past. We took nearly heterogeneous oscillators. These are the frequencies that we have for the oscillator. So one thing you should see that frequency of one plus three is nearly the frequency of two. So we have this triplet resonance condition and the frequency of one plus three is the same as the frequency of oscillator through. So we have this triplet resonance condition. And then when they are uncoupled, the oscillators of course have their own dynamics. And then they are not, uh, you know, this, even these triplets are not exactly identical. It's approximately identical. And then when we turn on this coupling, we found out that there is a modulation of the natural frequencies. There is no any apparent synchronization, but the frequencies slow down, the system slows down and speeds up, slows down and speeds up on very large time scale, on the order of hundreds of oscillations. So each of these points in the frequency is an average about 10 cycles. Uh, the blue is the experimental measurement here. Uh, and then this uh, the red, uh, the and then the red one is the is the phase model description. We could only interpret this sort of variation by a phase model that considered the triplet phase differences between the oscillators. Pairwise phase differences, we could not simulate these uh, oscillators. And then the natural the frequency, instantaneous frequency of oscillator one was affected by the by both of these uh, triplet phase difference. Oscillator two is only one, two, three oscillator. Oscillator three is again, is part of both of these uh, phase differences and oscillator four, again, only one of these. And the surprising thing about this is that the original network was a linear, is, is a ring. This is a ring of oscillators and yet its phase dynamics completely settles to a triplet phase difference. So we could, we managed to interpret the theory of this and then I will just, uh, uh, what I'd like to show you that this theory, we could also predict other type of uh, networks that, that emerge, this triplet uh, phase differences. And we have now, if you look at our paper, we have now a, also a computer code that you can just put in the, the frequencies and you put it what kind of nonlinear coupling you have with some, with some limit. And then we have this theory that can predict this uh, all kinds of uh, superposition of these, of these triplet, uh, the uh, triplet uh, kind of uh, interactions, which are hyper networks because they come from interactions for, for multiple nodes. So this was the main part of my talk. And at the end, I'd just like to show you that we also do open loop control. So when I started to work with uh, Professor Jershin Lee at WashU, he's a great control engineer. He told me you use real time real-time feedback when you don't know what the system enough and you don't know what you are doing. If you really know what you are doing, you try to use open loop control. So in open loop control, we just uh, determine the, the waveform and then apply the waveform and you don't have to measure the state at every single time of the system. Maybe you measure at the beginning and then you achieve the state that you want. So we developed this, this technique that we call phase assignment. It is an open loop technique and then in open loop techniques, very often you need to know the initial state of the system. You determine the waveform, you apply the waveform and you, you achieve a pattern. But the interesting thing about this phase assignment technique that we achieved is it does not require the initial state value. You can just apply the state, you can just apply this waveform that we developed because the synchronization state is globally converging. And the other very important uh, advantage of this, of the other important aspect of this technique that we developed is, in fact, it's very difficult to control with open loop system with oscillators that have the same frequency. They should have different frequencies. And this is where heterogeneity comes in because that's what the professor Lee explained to me. If they have different frequencies, they have different identities. 
And because they have different identities, we can individually control them. Uh, so we use again this phase model description. I think I told about this, that now we have a forcing signal and we will look at the phase in terms of the phase of the oscillations with, refresh, with ref, uh, respect to this forcing signal. So we look at the phase difference, how the phase difference evolves as a function of the frequency detuning and this phase interaction function that uh, comes from the phase response function, how the system responds in terms of phase to a pulse perturbation uh, and the waveform, of the, the, the waveform of the signal that we put in, right? So, all right, so how, the, how our system uh, really works? We have entrainment when the phase difference as a function of time is constant. This is the phase locking condition, right? So what it really means is that uh, then this phase interaction function has values the same as the frequency detuning we have. That's when at those phase differences we have entrainment. So if you plot the phase interaction function for a given waveform, and you know the frequency detuning, you will typically have uh, two or more intersections and the negative slope will give you the phase difference where entrainment is possible. And we have two such phase differences. One of them is stable and the other is unstable. So this point will be the, the, the phase difference where the system is uh, going to be entrained. So how does our phase assignment technique works? Our question is, if you want to get a certain phase difference to be engineered, and you know the natural frequency of the oscillators, you know one point on this phase interaction functions. So the, and then we can draw then some sort of, we know that it has to be stable, so the slope has to be negative. So we draw, we, 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 we write a two periodic function that goes through this point, so that there are only one stable intersection here. And then once you know this, this phase interaction function, you know the phase response function, and thus you can calculate the, the waveform that can induce this phase interaction function. And then we demonstrated this uh, technique with, lot, with, uh, with many uh, techniques. For instance, how to engineer in-phase synchronization. You know that you have, two, you have two oscillators. They have the same phase difference because they are in-phase, but they have different uh, frequencies. Right, So we need to have an interaction function that goes at a high slope through the same point. And this is an experiment that we did. Two oscillators, very different natural frequencies, they oscillate, oscillate in phase. You would say, well, this is very easy to do. If you apply the sinusoidal waveform with large enough amplitude, you would get the same. I agree with you, this is the case. But how would you get robust anti-phase entrainment with the same waveform applied to the two oscillators? So you pick one oscillator that has a certain frequency and we expect certain phase difference. And the other phase difference, we draw exactly pi apart because we want them to be exactly anti-phase. We know its frequency. So we know two points of the phase interaction function. And now we can draw two of such curves. And then we just uh, uh, draw this. We use error functions to, to draw these uh, phase interaction functions. And then we can get the in, uh, waveforms. One thing I like to point out, and then you know, we did this and it worked out beautifully. This is an experiment, two oscillators, different frequencies, beautifully anti-phase synchronized. Same oscillators, in-phase synchronized. One thing you can see that these waveforms are extremely non-trivial. These are, if you look at it, you will think, well, it's almost like noise. But no, this is, we call it resonant entrainment because the oscillator has two different frequencies. We can very carefully engineer their states. And then we demonstrated this with population of oscillators where you have two groups. And then here we need to engineer the natural frequencies of there, the two oscillators. So the slow oscillators will have certain phase. The fast oscillators will have a phase of pi apart so we can have a two cluster state with pi apart. Or if you want to get these 20 oscillators, 119 cluster state, one oscillator has some phase, the other's anti-phase, or it's a four cluster state. We have four groups of oscillators with four different frequencies, but we can engineer the phases very easily. So here we spread the four groups, not uniformly out of the unit cycle, but uh, constrain them from one and uh, pi, from with zero and pi, four cluster states. We also showed how to engineer itinerant clusters. So these are some clusters 
what we mean Ethereum clusters is that we try to stabilize the system to a two cluster state. We can obtain a waveform for that and we can get the waveform from another synchronized state. We can engineer a waveform from that. You would think this uh, works uh, very simply, but in fact, this is there are still some challenges with this. So I, I, we, we built a 20 electrode system and we wanted first to get some sort of two phase clusters in the shape of this O pattern. You may recall when we did this two cluster state with feedback, we got, we didn't have any spatial pattern. It was just like a random two cluster state. So in this case, we, we could take these oscillators that have, uh, these are the fast oscillators and these are the slow oscillators and we can easily engineer the two cluster state that can go in a certain pattern. But Lavi just took a representation of a K pattern. Now different oscillators must have similar frequencies. Like uh, So it is not so trivial to do this. And the way we solve this problem is that we create four group of oscillators. They have different frequencies. One group is always stays together they are the slow ones. The other group in the other color, in the yellow color, they always stay together. And there are oscillators that change from in-phase to anti-phase. And then other oscillators switch for anti-phase to in-phase. So we create an additional pattern in between we apply these two patterns that switches the position of these two oscillators. What was supposed to be anti-phase, we bring them to in-phase. And what was here, it's in-phase, then it goes to anti-phase it's anti-phase, in-phase. So we create this intermediate signal. And then the final thing I like to talk about, and then this works very nicely. You can see this is an experiment with 25 oscillators. These are the phases. You can see the oscillations. We get a nice pattern O, and then the intermediate signal. And then finally, we go to the pattern K. And then we can switch them back and forth. We will go back to O and so on. So, all right, so, and then more recently, what we looked at is that however powerful this technique was, there are still some drawbacks. So one thing is that optimality was not addressed. So the question is, how can we, how can we do all this with small amplitude signal? And then in a biological system, you can think about the requirement for small amplitude to reduce some side effect that, you know, you can use, but also fundamentally, if you use too large amplitude forcing, the phase models uh, approximation are going to fail. So we, in order to extend the applicability of this technique, we have to use small power signals. And uh, when you make, when, when the frequencies are different and you have large, you know, very different oscillators, they may have different phase response curves. And then if you have the oscillators different phase response curves, like what are you going to do? Or technique work with a single phase response curve for each of the oscillator. This is very commonly used approximation to describe oscillator populations with weak heterogeneities. So here I show you what can you do usually is that you average the phase response curves, right? So you have oscillators, you measure them, you average the phase response curves and you, and you just assume they have difference in frequencies. So this is an experimental system. This oscillator is close oscillations close to Hopf bifurcation, we have a phase response curve. We have this oscillator is close to a homoclinic bifurcation. This has this phase response curve. They are very different. And we try to engineer the phase difference with this uh, phase assignment technique to a phase difference of pi over two. And we failed. The oscillator synchronized in in phase. It was not a, a numerical error. So we, we showed this in simulations. So, all right, and then this is when we started to work with Professor Lee and his wonderful students. This was done by uh, Bharat Singhal. And then the idea was that, you know, Bharat started to look at like how to use this phase assignment. And very often we solve this problem, the synchronization problems in Fourier space. You know, we describe the equations and like how to get these uh, different feedbacks, but eventually, it is much simpler to solve this. Very often the numerical implementation for obtaining this, this feedback values was with, uh, with Fourier coefficients of the waveform, of the interaction functions, of the phase response function. And then when Borat wrote this 
term, so we have a phase response curve with its Fourier coefficient. We have an oscillator waveform with its Fourier coefficient. The product of that gives you, gives you the Fourier, the product of the Fourier coefficients give you the Fourier coefficients of the interaction function. So he found out that he can rewrite this equation. What we actually were doing is solving a quadratic optimization uh, with the entrainment condition. And the optimization really means is minimizing the power of the signal, the integral of the square of the signal. Uh, so we, we set up these, these, these vectors of the Fourier coefficients of the frequency differences of the stability conditions, of the entrainment conditions, of the stability conditions. And this is nothing but a classical control problem where we minimize input power by minimizing this uh, with this quadratic function with uh, some entrainment conditions, which is the linear function and with stability of entrainment. And Borat also found out that this is actually, you can do it with different phase response curves. Right, so there is nothing that you no. Know, in, in the past, we just use the same phase response curves. Like, uh, but if you do it like uh, in a more methodological way, you can just uh, do this with uh, different phase response curves. So we did this the very same experiment that we did. We just followed. We have these two oscillators with different phase response curves to entrain them in pi over two configuration, and the two oscillators entrain very nicely in like pi over two, exactly what we expected, and we were able to do also with. Uh, apply this technique in experiments to different two cluster state. So we could take oscillators, we can fast oscillators and slow oscillators, and then you can entrain them in phase, one cluster state, nearly anti-phase, two cluster state, or also these more exotic states that two oscillators, although their frequencies are different. Yeah, so two oscillators have the same frequencies. They form the one cluster. The other oscillators have different frequencies, but they do not form one cluster. They split up into this uh, asymmetrical, more asymmetrical cluster states. So I think this was my last slide. And to conclude, now we have techniques, both open loop and closed loop techniques that we can very effectively engineer synchronization pattern. We first, we started with closed loop signals. This We have this delayed polynomial feedback and kind of our new direction is that we can also use the synchronization technique in the presence of heterogeneity, but not, it is not that we overcome the heterogeneities here, but heterogeneities really help reaching the synchronized state. Um, we can devise pairwise feedback signals that produce emergent hypernetworks, these triplet phase interactions, and then we also have this open loop phase assignment technique that the, the, the progress that we did in the past three or four years is that we can optimize this signal for signal power. We can also do this for entrainment rates, for instance. And uh, we can also do this with different uh, phase response curves. And if you just, if you want to see kind of overview, I know we have uh, these, uh, we have this a uh, lot of papers, we have this review paper I wrote a few years ago, it focused more on the closed look feedback signal. Yeah, thank you very much for the attention. Uh, thank you for this uh, very nice talk. Um, everyone is welcome to ask questions through the Q&A box. Already there are some three questions. Can you see the Q&A box? Uh, let me see, yes. Yeah, so the first question uh, was about, does the system of the ring of oscillators exhibit the bursting oscillations amplitude modulated states? So the, the ring of oscillators that I presented, they were just simple limit cycle oscillators with different amplitudes and frequencies. And uh, we do have a system with iron electrode dissolution which has these bursting oscillations. This, they, we have a very interesting chaotic bursting oscillations. So yeah, we didn't do this. Uh, I think now we are more going back to more methodological way, not just you know starting with the more complex one. We try to get the simple oscillators and stepwise manner, we go to more and more complex oscillators. And then there was this uh, other question. Uh, if the system, yeah, so what, so these bursting oscillations, 
usually occur when you have um, variables of different time scales, right? So you have a chemical species that reacts very slowly. And uh, uh, very often, for instance, what happens in these corrosion systems is that uh, the oxide films that we have have a certain porosity. There are pores in it, and it can become more porous or less porous as the oscillations take place. And this can this change of porosity can take place on the order of uh, maybe 10, 20 oscillatory cycles. And then it can make the system to go like back and forth between, so actually we have this very interesting system where the system does chaotic uh, transitions between oscillatory and stationary states. And... Yeah, how at constant coupling. Yeah, so one thing I can tell you that uh, we have not, this was a fairly new result and we have not, oh, the question is how bursting occurs at constant coupling strength in synchronization dynamics. We are observing this type of dynamics in our annular combustion at laminar condition. And I think I know the paper, I know the, a little bit uh, about the system. So I think this, this is related to this ring of oscillators where the system doesn't settle to a one cluster state. It doesn't settle to a two cluster state, but it kind of goes uh, in and out of this one and two cluster states. And we haven't analyzed this very carefully, like uh, you know, the exact spatial temporal features of how the system itinerates between these two states. This is one of the things, of, uh, things to do. And there is another question here. Let's see. Oh. Can you comment of possibility of phase modeling for chaotic system? Do you have any insight on designing optimal waveform from desynchronization of coupled oscillators? So this is two, two questions. So first, can you comment on the possibility of modeling of chaotic system? So that picture that I showed to you in the very beginning, one cluster, two cluster, three cluster, four cluster state, that was in fact with chaotic oscillators. So if the oscillators are phase coherent, then they basically, from synchronization engineering point of view, I think, they behave as noisy periodic oscillators. And these techniques that we described, they, they work. You know, we, we showed this, uh, this, this clustering, for instance, uh, that, uh, that that works. I'm not saying it works for all. Okay, so what happens if the system is non-phase coherent, right? Maybe non-phase coherent chaotic system is kind of interesting. I don't know. I, you know, like this is, I think, an interesting question. Okay, if the system is non-phase coherent, how do you use this technique? This is really challenging because, like I think sometimes I like to think of this phase-based engineering techniques has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. Advantages that it provides a very simple mathematical structure that is also predictive, but this application of this, of course, provides a limit to what it can do. And I think uh, non-phase coherent chaotic oscillators are beyond this limit. We need new technique. We, have, we need a new generation of technique to, to do this with non-phase coherent chaotic systems. And do you have any insights on designing optimal waveform from desynchronization of coupled oscillators? So, yes, yeah, so in the original paper of uh, the closed loop technique, we also showed this desynchronization of chaotic oscillators. Um, we, can, we can use, uh, what we showed in that paper is that very often we use linear delayed feedback to get desynchronized oscillators. And the reason is that Oscillators close to Hopf bifurcation, very when you apply linear, like a nearly harmonic waveform, when you apply a delayed linear feedback, you get first harmonic phase interaction functions. And then if you design a, an interaction function that has like a minus sign interaction function with weak higher harmonics, and we demonstrated that we can do this, then the system is going to be desynchronized. So, and then we showed that, for instance, that 
With linear feedback, you can get all kinds of cluster states, but with this technique, with this nonlinear delayed feedback, you can get beautiful desynchronized states. This is what we what we did. So the technique is capable of desynchronizing the oscillators if we overcome the, the, the coupling that is already present in the network. I think where our technique maybe lacks uh, some fidelity is very, it's at some feedback gains where the feedback gains are comparable to the inherent coupling in the system. So this is again like with weaker feedbacks. How can you take advantage of coupling inherently present in the system to have the system desynchronized? In other words, not all modes needs to be destroyed. Only those modes are needed to be destroyed that cause synchronization, right? And then I think you can help with the, with the required power. All right, so we had the mean field coupling model. Uh, does the coupling function used represent higher order coupling as you use polynomial delay coupling? Yes, uh, higher order coupling. Uh, I can think about higher order coupling in two different ways. Higher order coupling, of course, one way is that we, whether you, if, if we assume second order, third order, or fourth harmonic components, yes, we do. If you think about higher order coupling in terms of triplet interactions, we did not do synchronization engineering uh, outside that one example that I represented where we included higher order interactions. So, in the coupling model, does the represent higher order coupling if you use polynomial delay coupling? Okay, polynomial delay coupling, we did not consider higher order coupling. Okay, this is, this is of course, very deep question <laughs> to discuss here. In the, in the model that we discussed, it is true, we used epsilon order approximation. We, these are, these are weak coupling of, approximation. So we coupling is some sort of epsilon order in the description. So we, are, we consider epsilon order contributions and often to properly interpret the clustering. If there is no dominant epsilon order interaction, you need epsilon squared interactions. In the delayed polynomial delay coupling, we engineered epsilon order interaction functions and third order coupling, higher order coupling is often epsilon squared or epsilon cube coupling. And that's when you need to consider. So that's why we had to design this, this, this engine, this nonlinear feedback that did not produce epsilon order coupling, it produced epsilon squared coupling. And when you have epsilon squared coupling in the phase model, that's when you need to consider higher order interactions. But we didn't do a whole lot on this. We, had, we did it on this one paper. Yeah, this is again from Andrea Bijou. This is a very interesting question. What is the influence of coupling topology, coupling strengths, and time delay values have on network dynamics? So coupling strength and delay and topology. So the way we solve this problem is that we use a coupling topology, a coupling strength, and the coupling time delay, and we convert it to a phase model, and then we like to talk to our uh, theoretical physicist colleague, and we tell them, this is the phase model that we have. What do you expect for this uh, to be the behavior, right? So, okay, so what, okay, but some things, there are some general insights, of course, we can, we can see. I think we can just rely on, you know, findings of network science on synchronization. Coupling topology affects the critical coupling strengths based on the second largest eigenvalue of the network Laplacian. And so we can rescale the coupling strength based on the second largest eigenvalue of the coupling topology. Uh, coupling strength, uh, in the past, we always did this in phase model in, in weak coupling approximations. So now we, uh, now we try to look at stronger coupling. 
you know, kind of the simplest effect of coupling strength is, of course, you will simply reach the synchronized state faster. So the transient time to synchrony will be faster. And we demonstrated this as well. And then what is the effect of time delay on the network dynamics? Is time delay fundamentally shifts the different components of the phase interaction functions. So when you change the delay, you go from, let's say, a sine interaction function to cosine, to minus sine, to minus cosine, and then back to cosine. Now, of course, as you increase the delay, the phase model approximations uh, struggle more and more. The, so it's, we have this kind of relationship that you know, usually if the coupling strength times the delay is smaller than some value related to the stability of the limit cycle, this is this is the point we can use the phase model uh, descriptions. These are the trivial effects, right? So there are, of course, very interesting research. What are the non-trivial e effects? And again, another question from Andrea. What is the real-life analog for heterogeneity through the non-zikonic -non term? Excellent question. This is the question I asked Edison. So, you know, Edison had this beautiful, Edison Motel from Northwestern University had this beautiful paper, series of papers, they showed that when you add heterogeneity through the non-isochronosity term, then heterogeneity in the non-isochronosity term could induce, had, could induce synchronization. So the first thing I also told Edison, this is so unrealistic. How do you introduce heterogeneity to non-isochronosity term without inducing heterogeneity to other terms? Maybe you can change you no know, distance to bifurcation or some you know relative impact of some sort of nonlinearity. And I think you know what the interesting part of the research was that when you it uh, when you add heterogeneity in real to real life systems, you add heterogeneity through many parameters, including non-isochronicity. And the heterogeneity through non-isochronicity overcomes the effect of heterogeneity through the other terms. Heterogeneity in natural condition, heterogen uh, in natural frequency, heterogeneity in amplitudes. So we, we didn't engineer or anything about adding heterogeneity in non-isochronicity parameter. We add just heterogeneity to a system parameter that affected the distance to bifurcation uh, uh, so it, it changed everything. And in the paper, we analyzed these other effects uh, on like how amplitude changed and frequency changed. Again, another question from and Andrea. Uh, is nonlinear coupling between oscillators necessary for the emergence of triadic and higher order interactions? Is nonlinear coupling between oscillators is necessary we have derived in the paper, not me, sorry, Tiago Pereira and Eddie Miholt, <laughs> they derived the necessary and sufficient conditions for these interactions for Stuart Landau oscillators, right? So, okay, so the way your theory works is that you provide the natural frequencies and you provide the had the, the nonlinear coupling term, and then we can calculate the, the triadic terms. In the Stuart Landau oscillators, within the framework of the theory, they require both nonlinear coupling and both uh, frequency heterogeneity, because otherwise the Stuart Landau oscillators will just synchronize to a one cluster state or some very trivial. Uh, these are phase models, right? So uh, I, they would synchronize to a uh, to a uh, one cluster or two cluster state. And again, the nonlinear coupling is important not to have epsilon order terms in the phase model description, but we have to have because or not to have synchronizing epsilon order teams. Some because otherwise the system will just settle. To a, to a to a epsilon order synchronized state, so that's why we need the nonlinear coupling to have the a special type of nonlinear coupling that induces epsilon squared triadic interaction without causing epsilon order uh, synchronizing systems. 
So thank you for the comment from Sandeep Varad. Uh, interesting phase assignments, implementation of delays. How oregonator oscillating models in busy reactions would work in state feedback or delay modeling approach? How oregonator. So, okay, so we did, we demonstrated some of the, some of the synchronization engineering type of techniques with oregonator models as well. So it is oregonator model, like, you know, it shows oscillations by, uh, through Hopf bifurcation. So very close to Hopf bifurcation, uh, we would have, um, very close to Hopf bifurcation, we would have a harmonic waveform oscillations and thus, you know, you could try modeling it. Uh, so we showed that as you go away from the whole bifurcation in the oregonator, the linear feedback, for instance, you can get the system through one cluster state, two cluster state, three cluster state, four cluster state, just like as the phase model would predict. So, so we showed that you know these clusters, you know, in the presence of some delays, they can show. Uh, Hiroshi Kori very often told us, okay, can you give us me like a simple ordinary equation systems where I can study this synchronization engineering technique. So he used this oregonator model in a few of our papers. One thing is, you know, what parameter, when you do control, you have to pick an observable and you have to pick a parameter and they are very important, right? Uh, uh, so I think the question is very interesting from the perspective that if you have like a chemical reacting system, which, what will be your observable is will be like in the originator, you can observe X and you can observe Y and Z and it depends which version of the originator model you, you use. And then how do you control it? The, you know, what, what parameters do you control? And then like one thing I, I like to mention that, that kind of interests me in terms of this is that very often we look at chemical systems, we don't measure directly concentrations, but we measure uh, absorbance. And we know from the lombard bear law is that absorbance is proportional to the concentration and absorbance is, is logarithm of the concentration. So, So we, we, it is, there is some, if you just try to control something, control a chemical system through absorbance, there is a fundamental nonlinearity in the control uh, that I think was uh, not so well explored. This, and you know, like you know, something related in biology is that when you apply a control to a biological system, there are also uh, some limits. There is a step response, that very strong signal, like limits of the effect, very weak, uh, a response limits of the effect. So even that is very difficult to do purely linear control. So I think the uh, panelists can ask questions now. The general questions are answered. I think there are two questions in the chat box from the panelists, but they can also ask the question directly. Uh, pardon me, there are new questions? Or... Uh, in chat box. If you click on chat, you can see two, the two questions on the chat. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. So, oh, oh, so I have a little bit of a delay, right? By the time I see uh, the question, so I see another question from Andrea Bijou. Is in gen in general, can we say clustering is a result of non pairwise interactions? If not, how can we distinguish when is it so? Very good question. No, I would say clustering is a general property of coupled oscillators, coupled nonlinear oscillators. You can get clustering with linear coupling, linear pairwise coupling of nonlinear oscillators, and we demonstrated that. Or you can get clustering with nonlinear pair, but pairwise interactions, nonlinear pairwise interactions of nearly harmonic oscillators, right? So these are both general ways of uh, of producing cluster cluster states uh, 
my intuition is we didn't do much work on this non-pairwise interaction results in non-pairwise synchronization patterns. That would be a naive, uh, uh, a naive assessment of what is their uh, impact. Uh, but of course, they are difficult to observe, right? So non-pairwise synchronization patterns, like triplet synchronization patterns, are more difficult to observe and search for it because you just have so many different uh, pairs to, to obtain. So I would say that when non-pairwise interactions result in cluster state that's kind of interesting uh you know but what is what kind of clusters you can get are they uh one thing is that there there is you no know, there was a reason we did not consider non-pairwise interaction in our synchronization engineering technique people just say well you know you can use just any kind of uh, non-linear coupling <laughs> in any kind of delay you would get something this actually took us a long time this is you no. Know, this is extremely carefully written because a lot of non-pairwise terms. So, what is the simplest non-pairwise terms? Like, if you look look like uh, you know x uh, a x plus uh, x one plus x two plus x three cube, right? And then you have you have terms x one times x two times x three, like things like that. Those are the simplest non-pairwise terms. And for a sufficiently large systems, the contributions cancels, cancel out due to the law of large numbers. So they often non-resonant. So I think the question is, if, if, you, if you say, OK, you have a non-pairwise interaction that produces in clustering, like how it is that they do not that they do not cancel out. Now they will not maybe cancel out for like, if you just have three oscillators, right? Or like if you have six oscillators, but as you increase the number of oscillators, you have to be careful because these non-pairwise interactions very often cancel out each other and they do not produce any sort of synchronization pattern. Mm. Oh, I see. Oh, we also have chat. Oh, I see. Very good. Now I found the chat. Oh, this time. Okay, there is one question in the chat you mentioned. How do you identify if there is any hypergraph structure in the system of oscillators when the couplings are unknown? So, yeah, so we just use the, like we have this technique that we developed with Professor Lee. And, you know, currently we use that technique. Uh, we call it uh, icon technique which is just a numerically effective way of fitting phase models to experimental data. So, you know, it is uh, the nice thing about fitting, uh, fitting uh, phase models to experimental data is that phase models are expressed in Fourier transform of the phase interaction functions, which are, uh, which is a full set of bases, right? And the autonomous set of bases. So you would think it's easy to fit them. They can be uniquely fit, but there are a lot of numerical problems. So you like, if your interaction network is sparse, you can use something like lasso and then fit lasso to it. Uh, and there are a few recent papers also from you know a group of Tiago Pereira where they show how to fit to... Uh, effectively uh, phase models for, or you know, some any kind of models to uh, to some to some data to some phases so you take the derivative of the phases and you try to fit the phase models and to my knowledge to the best way we can fit to identify hypergraph structure is simply by fitting uh, to the technique that you have. You can, of course, I think you can also measure uh, synchronization in, in indices. And if you have high level of synchronization index, right? So that, that can indicate uh, hypergraphs kind of interactions. So this question was in the chat, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, can you get, yeah. can you use your synchronization engineering technique for Controlling explosive synchronization. 
Yeah, this is a very good question. Let me, this guy, I have to think a little bit. Uh, we have a look at it. So I, I, yeah, I think just, uh, let me just uh, think about it. So let's say we take a population of oscillators and we like to create a system that shows a type of implosive synchronization. Or so I, can the, I can also ask the reverse question. If I have a system where I have explosive synchronization, which I don't desire, is there a way to stop it? So Yes. Oh, no, no. Well, first, let me try to answer. So, so in my view, like explosive synchronization is kind of a, you know, a, is a, is a way of uh, having like bistability between synchronized and desynchronized <laughs> systems. So that you increase the the coupling strength and the system goes from the you know, one type of synchronized system that is a desynchronized system in this case, and then it shows a transition to a synchronized system, and then we come back and then you you have high level of synchrony and then you go back to a desynchronized system. And uh, I mean, to my knowledge, this the best way to do this is with low pass filtering. So if you introduce a low pass filter in the synchronization engineering technique, and we very often do, we have a manuscript that is, I think, ready for submission, where we include low pass filter in the synchronization engineering technique, and then we show that uh, explosive synchronization occurs. Right? So, okay. So what, what, yeah, how do you do the opposite? So I think, like, generally speaking, if you want explosive synchronization, I think you can use Lupus filter <laughs> and uh, in the global signal. And then how do you reverse that? I think you have to do an inverse lupus filter. I don't know. There are engineers that maybe you can think about. <laughs> maybe it's not possible to do. It. So uh, yeah, I didn't think about this. But you know, loop like, like what you have to do is uh, basically if you have maybe a synchronized system and a desynchronized system, there is an intermediate, like healthy synchronized system. And then if you stabilize that that system with an adaptive control or something like this, that was demonstrated by a few people, then effectively you, you got rid of. So when you do this uh, adaptive control, very often you have like a control parameter that can track that can start from, let's say, desynchronized, and then you have a parameter that you can change. And then that you know, with that parameter, you can track down the desynchronized state, the intermittent, the in-between states, and the fully synchronized states. And then you are able to track down this middle branch. For instance, Ralph Tonyas had a paper where he demonstrated that this works. So this is how we do it. <laughs> By stabilizing this. That, uh, who demonstrated this? I think Ralph Tonyas, okay. Ralph Tonyas at uh, Potsdam University, he had a paper where he showed uh, this tracking of the intermediate states. I see one more question in the Q&A box. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. And also the other panelists, if there are questions, Professor Lakshman and MB. Yeah, very good. This is like a very good question. Is it possible to get explosive synchronization without the bistability in the system? So yeah, this is a very interesting question. Like I'm not an expert on explosive synchronization, you know, like but I read uh, like, like a few papers. I think like my understanding is most of the most of the explosive synchronization was through this uh, this bistability uh, mechanism. But we know that explosive transitions in nonlinear dynamics can occur without, without bifurcations, just by uh, like this Connard, this Connard explosion of amplitudes. I do not know any uh, demonstration of that. Uh, like, you know, we have to be careful with explosive synchronization without bistability because uh, you can, of course, always study a system like a singular case. And then, okay, you got this, you got it singularly, like a very like uh, abrupt transition for desynchronized to synchronized state. And you, this is due to singularity in the particular mathematical model that you get. 
Then you go to an actual nonlinear model with weak higher harmonics, and then this explosiveness smooths itself out, and then you and then like an like a you know, reasonable actual system, you have more smooth transitions, or like you know we have this sort of bistability transition. So, yeah, good question. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, we are out of questions. Uh, Professor Lakshman, mm -hmm. Professor Ambika, do you have any questions? Yeah. Do you, do can you... I have a question? So I was just wondering whether this type of coupling can introduce any other emergent dynamics like chimera states. Hmm. Yes, we have demonstrated that uh, you can use synchronization engineering for chimera states. Okay. So this is a uh, so one. There are two different. So chimeras usually occur with networks, right? So the simplest way to do this is with two groups of coupled oscillators and then you can have like control that appears you know acts in one group with higher gain from the same group and a little bit weaker gain from the other group and then even delayed feedback like a simple linear delayed feedback should, should generate the usual group chimeras what we did is we engineered weak chimera states so we engineered strong first harmonic and weak second harmonic in the interaction functions, and we put it on a network, and it, it showed beautiful uh, big chimera states. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Professor Lexman, do you have a question? I guess not. So I think mm -hmm. we are through all the questions. So at this point, I want to thank you for delivering this very nice uh, talk. Also, I think the question um, has been there for uh, quite some time, more than half an hour, I mean, 40 minutes questions. It's very interesting. And I'm glad you didn't get tired out. And uh, <laughs> thanks for us. And the next talk will be by Professor Kira Renfield from the University of Tubington. Tubingen. She'll talk about climate variability from the local to the global scale on April 29th, last Monday, next month. At the same time, mark your calendars and we hope to see you at the next one. Once again, thank you, Stavan, for this very nice talk. I learned a lot and I will read the review paper for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Have a nice rest of the day and bye-bye. <laughs>